Hey guys, Jay here. Welcome to Models and Memories Weekly, Episode 7, The Paint Awakens. Models and Memories is a show about nothing filmed in front of a live studio audience. And stay tuned till the end to see a montage of miniatures courtesy of the EOB Complete community. This is a show where I talk about my painting, modeling, and wargaming experiences from the week, and I end every single episode with a story. Now you might think to yourself, Jay, you live stream every night and you put out three YouTube videos a week. How? Could you have more to say? Well, I do. And here goes. This week, I don't know if there's anything else to talk about, but Warhammer Fest 2021 online. Now, I was definitely late to the party with this one because I didn't know Warhammer Fest was a thing or that it was happening online or when it was happening. Even though I'm a, I am love the Warhammer community and I love all the stuff coming out, I'm pretty much unplugged from it. Usually stuff has to trickle, trickle on down to me. I'm definitely not checking Warhammer community every day. If Kiryoth makes a video about it, that's basically how I know what's going on with Warhammer. So Games Workshop has picked these six days to unveil all of the wonderful things they're working on, which to me seems a little odd because they come out with stuff pretty constantly. And so the new stuff doesn't feel quite as exciting as maybe some of the previous stuff. I mean, Lord Croak came out a few weeks ago and it's like the size of a basketball. So I don't know. It's still pretty cool though. Midway through Tuesday, I started hearing the rumblings about all these new models, so I decided to check it out. And on the Warhammer community, I got to see all the cool new models they came out with. And the first one was Kragnos. Kragnos. Karagnos. Karagnos. Uh, the end of empires. This guy is pretty cool. He, this model, so what happened when I looked at this model is Part of me was like, yeah, that that exists, right? Like that's a model they already came out with, like a, a centaur giant. It's a it's a sweet model. I am not saying anything bad about the model, but just I'm not a fantasy person. And when I saw it, I was like, yeah, that makes sense. Centaur knight warrior guy, big horns. It just it didn't it didn't grab me. It's a wonderful model. It's super beautiful. I'm sure it's gonna be plenty of people's favorite model that they've ever had or worked with or seen. But when I saw it. One of my first reactions, which is completely unfair and weird and crazy, but I thought it looked a little like my dog. So usually, usually when you see a centaur in things like Harry Potter or Narnia or something, it looks like a kind of a bad Photoshop job. You have a 100% regular ass horse body and then a 100% regular human body. And even though it's awkward and like the human body looks super small, like a horse weighs a thousand pounds and a human weighs like a like a buck seventy. So it's just weird mismatch. And so with this model, they've done a very clever thing and they shortened up the legs, they kind of fattened up the body to match the proportions of the uh, the big muscly warrior. And it looks great, but just seeing a horse's body kind of plumped up with little legs reminded me exactly of my dog. <laughs> it's completely ridiculous but it looks a little like my dog. Like, you know how you get used to your dog and you can just, you spot it instantly. Like, you know, you just see your dog walking in a dark room. You can barely see anything. You know, it's your dog. That's what I saw when I looked at the bottom half of this model. It's brilliant that they, they fixed it because it would look awkward if it was just a regular centaur. Centaurs are dumb, but uh, this model is great and it looks like my dog. So that was Cragnose, uh, nine out of 10, who cares? Next up though, this was the model that, that I was getting texts and, and chats and all sorts of things were coming at me. This model, Lauka Vi, Lauka Vi, Vey, Luca Vey, the mother of nightmares. This model, this model right here. I can see why this ruffled some feathers, but it's, it's pretty much perfect. Ah. Oh. It's weird, it's creepy. It's once again a centaur, which is kind of fun. I wonder if they were kind of doing a, a similarities thing. It's super weird. And I get a lot of, uh, it seems like a lot of people had kind of a gut feeling of, nah, not a fan, that looks weird. And I think, I think I know why, but for me, this model 100% works. It is creepy. It's a little like disturbing. It's super horrifying. It reminds me a lot of that Netflix movie, uh, The Ritual. In that movie, there's another weird kind of multi-limbed creature that's hunting people. That was a cool movie. Uh, but that that monster reminds me a little bit of this monster. And that's that's what I really like from Age of Sigmar. I love when things are weird and wacky. I think that's just why um, fantasy never interested me when it was Warhammer Fantasy Battles. But now that it's Age of Sigmar and they're getting weird with it, I actually really, really am starting to like it. Now, the only two things I don't like about this model, there's two things. One, I don't love 
how the bottom half is 100% just a, a weird monstrous monster with just exposed skin and a loin and like a tattered loincloth. It's completely monstrous, the bottom half. But then the top half is completely put together, proper uh, vampire countess. And that, it seems like a little bit of a disconnect. I think if, when, maybe I buy this model, I would either take the armor on her and bring some of that down onto the monster body, or I would probably, this would probably be what I do, is I would remove some of the armor from her and make her top half a little bit more monstrous to kind of mesh the two halves together. Because as it is, there is a line where up here, up here, it's all business, but down here, it's all party. It's like a mullet. But that's that's probably the only thing I would change. It's so creepy. I love the tattered wings that end in like the Lady Gaga little finger points. It's super, super weird. And oh, the second thing I don't like about this model is Games Workshop's paint job. It's great. The Games Workshop paint job is fine, but it's so blatant. When Games Workshop paints things, they paint it so that every single detail is accentuated, is brought, is made sharp. This model though, this model is surreal and it needs a surreal paint job. I cannot wait to see this model get out into the wild and have like really, really crazy brain arts people work on it. I mean, I'm thinking people are gonna be adding glitter. They're gonna be adding spatter paint, airbrushing. I think this model is really, really gonna look good in the hands of, uh, of someone who's willing to go a little like, weird with it. Also, it's begging for texture. I think if, when, maybe I get this model, I would be breaking out the Tamiya basic putty and stippling on texture everywhere. So yeah, this model, 10 out of 10, perfect. And then there was a couple more fantasy models, blah, 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 who cares? I don't care about fantasy, fantasy shamanacy. When I think about fantasy, I think with, with, you know, this big epic fantasy battle, I would fire one low yield proton torpedo out of my starship, just level the entire playing field. I mean, it's, it's the 40, like sci-fi is so extra where fantasy just feels like, you got the swords, and we're psh, 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 psh. I don't know, it just doesn't hold a candle to how exciting and interesting I feel like sci-fi is. And that was all on Monday. Monday was great, but Tuesday, Tuesday, they came out with one model for 40K, but that one model, <sighs> what a model. More than vile abyss. Mo more than evil. Abess, Av, Hal, Avil. Morven, Bal, Abess, Sanctorum of the Adeptus Sororitas. This model, holy moly. So just a little background on me. When the Paragon War Suit came out for the Sisters of Battle, I was absolutely in love. I'm definitely gonna be, I do wanna start a Sisters Army. They're very, very expensive, but I might be able to put together like a small force, like a limited number of bodies. And the way I want to do that is with the Paragon War Suits. I think they are exceptional. I know there, there's, you know, it's very mixed. It's a very divisive model. The kind of weird kind of baby carrier robot Sisters of Battle suits. I love them. I think the long like feminine legs on a robot is hilarious and actually I want to get this out of the way right, right, right at the beginning. I think it's really a really cool little piece of science having the, the little arms exposed because if I'm going to build a mech suit, like an Iron Man suit or anything, how would I control it? Like, wouldn't my left leg have to control the robot's left leg? My, my right arm have to control the robot's right arm. How would you do it other than that? It doesn't make any sense. Like, how would you? How, how with controls would I do all the things that my natural body does naturally? And so I think actually that's why Games Workshop keeps coming out with these designs like the Dread Knights and the Centurions where the, the human body is controlling a bigger human body. I actually think that's pretty awesome. And so, you know, the Sisters of Battle are very reasonably, you know, she moves her little arms and then the robot moves its big old arms. And I think that is awesome. You see that in almost every mech design. You see that in uh, Pacific Rim, they got the full body Power Ranger suits. In uh, Avatar, he's got the little power gloves on. You see that all the time in science fiction and I think it's actually a really cool design. It actually reminds me of how much I do not like the Primaris Invictor Tactical War Suit. The model's pretty dope, but I'm really annoyed that what used to be, you used to, you used to scrape a dead Marine off the battlefield and like hardwire them into a Dreadnought so presumably their body is controlling its arms and legs and those are what's controlling the Dreadnought's arms and legs. 
In this dumb model, there is a Primera sitting there. One hand has got a yoke, and the other hand has got a joystick. With those two controls, he might have foot pedals. With those two controls, he is controlling two legs that are doing whatever crazy thing. He's controlling an arm and an arm gun, and he's controlling another manipulator hand that has a giant robot pistol. I think that's ridiculous. My lawnmower has more controls than that, and it only goes forward, left, or right. Like, how is he doing all of that just doing this? It's not possible. It's, n it's dumb. It's dumb. But anyway, what happened yesterday, this model, the Moravan Val Abessal Sanctorum of the Adeptus Sororitas. I really, 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 really love the Paragon War Suits, but this model blows them out of the water. It actually does some, it has some key changes that are actually really interesting to me because clearly they were designed at the same time. Like there's been almost no gap. There could, there could not have gone back and made any changes. So, but some of the things I love in the new design versus the old design, there is a cloth cape, or not a cloth cape, but a cloth skirt that kind of covers up the legs. I know a big problem for some people, not really for me, I thought it was still pretty cool, but it was like, where are her legs? The leg, you know, you've got the legs inside of really skinny feminine robot tubes. Uh, here, there's just a, there's just a skirt. Whatever is under there, I'm sure it's more than enough to power to uh, manipulate the suit's legs. I love that. They actually chunked up the feet a little bit. I didn't really look at it until I saw this model. I didn't know what I didn't like until I saw what I liked. But uh, they chunked up the feet, and that actually helped a lot. The Paragon War suits kind of have a hoof, and it's a little bit... Now it looks weird to me. I think for sure when I get them, I'm going to fill that in with a little green stuff and make them look a little bit more like the feet on this model. But holy cow, this model. The, uh, the spear being held aloft. I love her little her little little human hands doing the pose, and then the robot is doing the real pose, the victory pose. It's great. It's got the uh, the shoulder mounted missiles that kind of look like your car's stereo, and the smokestack in the back has like little tiny Adeptus Sororitas models kind of hanging onto them like their shields. I mean, this model is amazing. Oh, and Games Workshop even wrote a great little line that I know ruffled a ton of people's feathers because I am a part of a lot of Necron groups on Facebook. As a High Lord of Terra and head of the Ordos Militant Nervanabajerbersabalabas, authority is absolute. Her status puts her right on par with other faction leaders like Cesarek the Silent King, Abaddon the Despoiler, and Captain General Trajan Valoris. Now a lot of people are like, um... She is not as powerful as Cesaric the Silent King. Cesaric has total control over his entire race, and that's not necessarily true. Cesaric was the, the Grand Master of the entire Necron race. He actually had controls, like joystick controls, to actually manipulate all the Necrons with during the War in Heaven and the Civil War, not the Civil War, but the war between the Necron, Necrotire in their Necron bodies and their Satan overlords. But Cesaric actually blamed himself for taking part in Biotransference. So when the War in Heaven ended and the Necrons all went into the Great Sleep, he destroyed the command protocols and went into exile. So Cesaric is actually no longer in complete control of his race. He has returned, but many Necrons choose not to follow him. Actually, chief among them is Imhotep the Stormlord and all of his legions do not follow Cesaric, which is actually really interesting. But in terms of her being on par with these characters, it probably is true in terms of like her importance to her particular faction. I definitely don't think she could go toe to toe with Cesaric or Abaddon or this captain, whoever he is. But uh, I think it is really fun when Games Workshop writes stuff like this. This is completely normal. If you look, if you look at the little paragraph under almost every model on the Games Workshop web store, it always says, no warrior could hope to stand against the might of X, Y, or Z. Like every single model is written exactly like that because Games Workshop has to deal with every model being someone's favorite. And so when you look at, you know, your Gretchen, underneath the Gretchen, it has to say, no, these Gretchen are so badass and awesome. Nothing could possibly stand up to these Gretchen. And so that's just how Games Workshop writes. I think it's fine. But yes, uh, Moravin Val Abess, the Sanctorum of the Adeptus Sororitas, the model is perfection. I want it dearly. I, I'm definitely gonna buy this model. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach myself perfect non-metallic metal gold. I've done some okay work in the past with non-metallic metal silver. I'm going to make myself learn non-metallic metal gold for this model. It will be glorious. 
Thank goodness Games Workshop picked this week to drop all this new stuff on us because this week for me was dominated by getting videos ready for YouTube. And if you like those videos and you like what you do, the best way to support us is becoming a member of our Patreon. Over there you'll get access to some behind the scenes, exclusive content, picking what models I paint live on YouTube, and extra live streams every single week. So check it out. Woof, what a week to be a wargamer. Now, this is a show called Models and Memories, and the models are obvious, but the memories are not quite as obvious. All of these things, my stuff, these represent all the things that I've collected, and each one is just an object, whatever. But inside of that object is the memories. It's a snapshot of what I was feeling and thinking when I was collecting, buying, or building that thing. And they all have stories attached to them, and I end each one of these episodes with that story. So this week, I'll talk about these. Actually, this one needs more props. This funny looking yellow contraption is something I made in high school. I actually uh, did this program in high school where I could spend half the day at the college, the local community college, learning to weld. Uh, and then I would go back to take all the regular classes. And that was probably some of the most fun I've ever had in my life. But this, this reminds me, it kind of keeps me tied in to all those hundreds and hundreds of hours welding. And I'm actually a very good welder now. I spent, I mean, I've spent thousands and thousands of hours welding, but boy, this really, this really brings me back to kind of the, just the, the weird feelings I had in that class. Cause all of a sudden I was a high school student, just BSing my way through homework and sitting in class and just being bored and, you know, doodling in my notebook and everything sucked. And then all of a sudden, I was at the community college and I was in this giant warehouse of a room in these welding booths with fumes pouring out the top and big burly men were around me. And it was weird. It was like, it was kind of like being a grown up all of a sudden for half the day. It was a really, really interesting, interesting environment. And it was work. It was real hard work. You put on a really heavy leather suit and then it's, you know, it's 100 degrees in the building and then you're working at a torch that's 1400 degrees and it's, you're just baking and you're wearing a mask that makes you in blind and then you just learn, but then the act of welding is so delicate. You're sitting there, if this is a welding torch and you've got a long electrode and you tap it to the metal and then and then an arc forms between the electrode and the piece of metal you're working on and even though you're sweating and you're hot and it's heavy and there's loud, loud noise. You just learn to really delicately, just like ice, like you're icing a cake. You never let the electrode dip too close to the metal. You keep the pool of metal moving. And it, it's a really, really weird experience where you just, you get immediate tunnel vision, which is easy because you can't see. And you're just, you're just running that electrode along the metal a hundred times a day for, you know, four and a half hours. It was a really, really, really interesting experience. And in that time, every now and again, usually my time was split between just weld, 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 or doing, you know, book work where you're learning everything about metallurgy and, and the basics, the, the math you have to learn. And, but every now and then we had a little bit of free time. And so I would make things. One of the things I made was this little tree. Now this is when we were learning to MIG weld. And it is actually a really nice looking little tree. And I was just super bored one day. I had, you know, welded together 10,000 just bars of metal. It's called a butt weld when you put them right up against each other. But the way I did this is I took, I took my welding gun, which when you MIG weld, you actually have a little gun and then there's a spool of wire coming to the gun. And so I just sat there and I went bzz, 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 bzz. And I just tapped it and it would put down a little blop of metal. And I just did that a hundred times until it made this little tree. And then I would uh, take a piece of metal. This isn't really that the smartest thing to do in the world, but I would take a piece of metal and I would weld upside down and I would let it just weld and weld and weld and weld until a big blob would form and then drop and splash onto the table. And then I would chip off the, the splash. And that is how I made these little, uh, the leaves of the tree. And it actually turned out really, really nice and very sharp. But I remember on my last day of class, I did, I took this for a year and it was super fun. On my last day of class, I decided I wanted to build something useful. And so I made this. It's all made out of like 
3 16 steel stock. It is actually TIG welded together. TIG welding is a whole different thing where you have uh, an electro, you have your metal in one hand, you have your electrode in the other, and you're actually controlling it all with a foot pedal. And it's a, it's this fun little dance you do across the metal where you have to, you have, you're controlling the flow of electricity with your foot. You're controlling the heat with your distance on your electrode. And then you're controlling your fill rod or how much metal is being deposited. That was actually my favorite. It was the most fun. I really, really took to that. But I took some, some steel stock. I bent it together. I knew this, I was wargaming at this point and I needed an airbrush holder. And that is exactly what this is. I didn't plan anything. I didn't measure anything, but it actually worked perfectly. It even is up tall enough that I can leave my airbrushes air hose plugged in. And I use this for years and years and years. I don't use this anymore, although I still miss it. And I haven't gotten rid of it. Cause it's just, it's such a moment. It's such a snapshot of my welding experiences. And I have some of the assignment pieces, but this one is special to me because I designed, built and fabricated this myself. Now I have this, which is a two airbrush holder. It's very nice. It does its job perfectly. It just holds both of my airbrushes and it is, it is better than this. I don't know, I still like this. I don't know if I'll ever be able to uh, to get rid of it or recycle it. But yes, this reminds me of the hours and hours and hours, the bus rides to and from. I would, on the bus ride, I would take a bus. No, I would drive myself to school and then get on a bus to take out my Necron Codex and read the Necron Codex all the way to the college. Just weld. And another fun thing that would happen is, uh, you know, the cosmetology students would, you know, go in, go into their class and come out of their class. And the culinary arts kids would go, the criminal justice kids would go and come out. And then the welding kids would go in looking like children and come out looking like coal miners. Like we were sweaty, we were dirty. Like we needed, like we almost needed showers. It was, it was kind of beautiful. Everybody, everybody else was walking back to the buses like children and we're coming back like men and women because there were women in the class, but, uh, yeah, this, ah, this is a really fun little thing. It sure doesn't look like much, but boy, oh boy, if it's not one of my favorite little objects. But this is my story for this week. I actually got to do some welding not that long ago, and it was a little bit magical after taking like a, a four year break, and then all of a sudden, kunk, the helmet flips down, I can no longer see, and I strike up the arc. It was pretty fun. But that means the story's over, and this is the end of the episode. This is the seventh one we've done, which means there's plenty of other ones for you to watch, but that's all for this episode. And now it's time to see a montage of minis courtesy of the EOB Complete. We put out a challenge to our community to send us before and after photos of their recently finished models to be immortalized in our videos. If you wanna join in the fun, you can submit a before and after photo of your painted mini to our Discord server, which you can find in the description below, or you can post it to Instagram with the hashtag EOB Complete. Without further ado, let's look at and get inspired by what the folks have finished this week. A Chili Guardsman by Just Make Stuff, an Eldar Tank by Misa Sith Lord, some Ral Partha Minis by Brett S, a Tech Priest by Grim Dark Master, some Plague Terminators by Jim T, some Ogren by Moav Accord, some Necrons by Finian, an Imperial Knight by Ethanos, some Tanks by Prussian Blue, a Fabius Bile by Disco, some Space Marines by Erebus, some Orc Boys by Nick, some Space Wolves by Forty, some Knights by Junak, some Assault Intercessors by Reed, a Diorama by Z Rule, a Stormcast Eternal by Dark Nova 642, an Imperial Knight by The Distraction, an Orc Buggy by Dakaflock of Flame, an Elf Archer by Kakilla, a Bosk by Boba Fett IG88, and some Heavy Intercessors by Woe77. Congratulations to everyone for a job well done. It's no small feat to get paint on minis and you all should feel really proud. Nothing gets the hobby juices flowing like finishing a project, and we all thank you for sharing your work, motivating us and the hobby community to paint our plastic. Thanks for sharing.